Tutor Education in 10 Minutes. The Tudor period began in 1485 with Henry VII and ended in 1603 with Elizabeth I. In Tudor time, there was no organised system of state education for everyone. There was no curriculum and it was not mandatory to go to school, just the opposite. Many children did not go to school at all. Poor boys as young as seven or eight might be apprenticed to learn a trade. Although there were schools for girls, many parents did not think it worth educating their daughters. It was thought more important for girls to learn how to run a household to prepare them for marriage. For those that could go to school, the boys usually went to a kind of nursery school called a petty school, then moved on to a grammar school when they were about seven. The school day began at 6am in summer and 7am in winter. People went early to bed those days. Lunch was from 11am to 1pm. School finished about 5pm. Boys went to school six days a week and there were few holidays. In the early 16th century, many boys went to chantry schools. Rich men left money in their wills to pay priests to pray for their souls. After the religious change of the 1540s, the chantry schools were closed. However, many rich men founded grammar schools. In Henry VIII's reign, the leading schools in the city of London were St Anthony's and St Paul's. These were both fee-paying grammar schools for rich boys. They were called grammar schools because they taught Latin grammar. The boys would also learn other subjects such as mathematics, geography and literature. Henry VIII's son, Edward VI, founded Christ's Hospital as a school for orphaned boys and girls. Later, rich parents asked that their children be allowed to go there too. During Queen Elizabeth's reign, there were several new schools founded by wealthy city merchants, such as the Merchant Taylor School. There were also various schools for less wealthy children that taught basic reading, writing and arithmetic. Many Tudor towns and villages had a parish school where the local vicar taught boys to read and write. During the reign of Henry VIII, many schools attached to monasteries suffered, often being shut. This happened when Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church, the Reformation, after it refused to agree to him divorcing his wife. Henry VIII needed well-educated men to work for him. When the monasteries closed, Henry had to re-found many monastic schools using his own money. This is why there are so many kin's schools all over Britain. Of course, many Tudor boys did not go to school at all. If they were lucky, they might get a seven-year apprenticeship and learn a trade. Some craftsmen could read and write, but few labourers could. As for girls in a rich family, a tutor usually taught them at home. In a middle class family, their mother might teach them. Upper class and middle class women were educated, however the lower class girls were generally not. Tutor children who did not go to school were expected to work. They helped their parents by doing tasks such as scaring birds when seeds were sown. They also helped to weave wool and did other household tasks. Children from rich Tudor families usually had their marriages arranged for them. If they refused to marry the person their parents chose, they were beaten until they changed their minds. Children from poorer families had more choice over whom to marry, yet girls usually married young. Many were married when they were only 15 or 16. Boys often married between the ages of 18 and 21. School days were very long, often from 7 in the morning until 5 or even 6 at night. Pupils worked from Monday to Saturday with a half day on Sunday and no more than three two-week holidays throughout the year. They started school around the age of 7 and left at about 15 when they were considered adults. There were few books and they were very expensive, so pupils read from a horn book instead. These wooden boards had the alphabet, prayers or other writings pinned to them and were covered with a thin layer of transparent cow's horn. Pupils wrote with a pen made from a goose or hen quill 
which had to be trimmed with a pen knife. They dipped their quill in ink and had to be careful not to blot or smudge the paper. If they made a mistake, they would be punished. Lessons were all learnt by repetition. Pupils were often expected to speak in Latin. They were also taught Greek, religion and mathematics. The boys practiced writing in ink by copying the alphabet and the Lord's Prayer. Teachers were very strict, often beating their pupils with birches if they misbehaved. Birches were a type of cane. Teachers would use 50 strokes of the birch. Pupils were sometimes too scared to go to school because of the beatings. And if they were late or dirty, they would again be beaten. Pupils from wealthy families could often afford a special friend called a whipping boy. When the rich child was naughty, it was the whipping boy who received the punishment. At about 15 or 16, the brightest boys might go on to one of England's two universities, Oxford and Cambridge. At university, students learned the seven liberal arts of grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, astrology and music. In the 16th century, they began to study the humanities. The Tudor age was a great time of educational advancement in England, with the universities thriving and grammar schools founded in record numbers. Yet for all this, records of the education of Tudor girls are extremely sparse. At the start of the Tudor period, girls were, for the most part, taught informally in their homes. Religious education was of course essential, but whether girls received much else in their early training is less clear. By the 1530s, however, it was becoming fashionable for the gentry and nobility to educate their daughters. In this trend, many families strove to follow the example set by Sir Thomas More in the education of his three highly accomplished daughters. His friend Erasmus, too, recommended the education of women. It was their considered opinion that it would provide girls with the tools to assist their husbands in creating a Christian home after marriage and to raise their children virtuously. Richard Hurd, who wrote the introduction to Margaret Moore's translation of Erasmus's treatise on the Paternoster, echoed contemporary sentiments to the contrary. I have heard, he wrote, many men put great doubt whether it should be expedient or requisite or not, a woman to have learning in books of Latin and Greek and some utterly affirm that it is not only neither necessary nor profitable, but also very noisome and jeopardous. He had heard it said that such studies would inflame their stomachs towards vice. Hurd considered such a view erroneous, but it was a widely held one. At Norwich, even the very poorest girls were sent off to the schoolroom, although typically, girls' formal education often ended earlier than their brothers, when financial need made it necessary for girls as young as six to begin working for a living. Although the curriculum at such local schools was often basic, the fact that even the very poorest girls in Tudor society were able to potentially access a free education was revolutionary. Thanks to Thomas More and other humanists in the period, it became commonplace for girls to at least be able to read and write a marked improvement on the educational attainments of most medieval women. The widespread education of women, albeit to a lower standard than offered to men, was quite a revolution in the lives of women in that period. In a society so split between rich and poor, were you surprised that education was so widespread, even for the lower classes? Did you think that the inequality between the classes and genders was unfair or did you think it was more enlightened than you had realised? Let us know in the comments below. Tutor education in 10 minutes. Please subscribe, like or click on the bell to be notified of other upcoming videos. Thank you for watching. See you soon.